Welcome to our 100th episode of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. Leslie and I are so grateful to you for taking the time to listen, to be challenged, and to join us in ditching destructive teachings and embracing what the Bible actually says about relationships. And now for episode 100 of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. I'm Julie Sedenko here with relationship expert Leslie Vernick, and today we're going to help our listeners understand how to know if your husband's changes are real and if they'll last. Leslie, sometimes women, they can be so full of hope for the marriage to heal or for their husbands to change that they tend to ignore reality, that he's made that promise a thousand times before or he's not kept it or that he has a pattern of saying anything required in the moment, but then not following up. How can a woman first stop that cycle? Well, I don't know if she can stop the cycle, but she can certainly stop her side of the cycle. And one of them is to really define change. I think that might be really helpful for women to begin to ask their husband. So if you were to change, what does that look like to you? How would you handle, like, for example, if if it was anger issues? So how might you handle your anger different if you were if you were changed? How would you have handled the situation that scared us different? If you, what does change look like for you? Because I think this word change becomes so vague that we don't yeah. we can't pin anybody down on anything because we don't really know what it looks like and what we think it looks like and what they think it looks like could be two completely different things. Um, The same phrase, let's work on our marriage. What that looks like to you and what that looks like to him may be very different. So you both might agree, oh, we're going to go to counseling to work on our marriage. But what that looks like to him is you're going to stop nagging me. You're going to forgive me and you're going to let me move home. And what that looks like to you is that you're going to start being honest. You're going to not cheat anymore and stop watching porn. And it doesn't even look the same. So I think it might be helpful to start with just asking, what does change look like for you? And where, what does your marriage look like? So again, some good questions might be, if we had the kind of marriage you really wanted, what would that look like and sound like and feel like to you? And then you answer it yourself because his answer might be, I want a wife who does what I say when I want her to do it without giving me any grief and sleeps with me sleeps with me when I want without any argument. That may be his extent of what he wants from marriage. And that is certainly not what you want from marriage. A lot of times they'll just say, if you'd just be quiet, I'd have a happy marriage. Yeah. So, so, you know, again, we're working toward completely opposite poles. And so I think the first step, especially when the conversation is in crisis, that's the most opportunity to make a change when something bad has happened, the police have been called, the affair has been discovered, you know, the porn has been discovered, whatever is going on, to be able to say, if we were to fix this, what would that look like for you? Or if you were to change and not do this anymore, what would need to be different about you? And if he's not even willing to do the work to answer that question, I think a woman putting her hope and he's going to change is pretty hopium. It's not based on any reality. So what are the signs that a man's heart really has changed? I mean, I know it can't be that he's perfect from here on out. Well, one of the things that we see in our audience a lot, so we work with Christian women in destructive marriages, and we often see a real attitude of entitlement from husbands. I'm entitled to your forgiveness. I'm entitled to move home. I'm entitled to sex every night. I'm entitled to be the head of the home, which means you don't question me or you don't disagree with me or you let me do what I want without any consequences. There's a lot of entitlement thinking. So one of the changes that I would look for is has the heart changed from an attitude of entitlement to an attitude of humility? Like, wow, I've got a lot to learn. I don't know it all. God is really showing me some things about myself that need to change. So instead of I deserve and I'm supposed to get and you need to kind of language, it's more of a humble, I need to learn, I need to grow, I need some help. Um, And that would be a very good sign that you begin to see that heart change from one of pride and entitlement to humility and gratitude you know, instead of expectations of everybody doing things he wants, being grateful that you're really even willing to have this conversation and have a second chance or a fifth chance or a 20th chance wherever you are. 
So what does that look like? I mean, what does taking responsibility practically and and even making amends look like? I know there are women that wouldn't mind him, you know, getting on his knees and begging for forgiveness or taking her on a crew cruise to prove he's sorry, but that's not what you're talking about, I'm sure. So what does it practically look like? I mean, I know if he says I have a lot to learn, that's one thing, but like I said in the in the practical sense. Well, let's just start this conversation again by saying that change is hard for all of us. We're all in habit patterns. And so usually when we're looking at a destructive marriage, we're looking at a habit pattern of destructive behavior, whether it's a habit pattern of lying, a habit pattern of cheating, a habit pattern of using anger to dominate and control, a habit pattern of being manipulative or misleading, uh, deceitfulness, all of those patterns that are so unhealthy and so destructive to a marriage. And so any habit pattern that we want to change isn't changed by just wanting to. I mean, all of us can relate to this habit pattern of eating wrong or eating unhealthy. We, you know, I just made this commitment Monday that I was going to stop eating chocolate. And by Tuesday, I had three pieces. Oh, you know, I'm so totally like, with you there. You know, <laughs> you, know you you say I'm going to change and then I have an excuse or a reason why I needed that chocolate. Why that would you make that kind of commitment, Leslie? <laughs> well, I did. I stopped eating chocolate for two years. I did really did you well. Really? Wow. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, time to start, stop eating chocolate again. But I just need a little bit more structure and support this time. Last time I was able to do it this time. And, and this time also right now, it's just a really busy time. And so it's harder for me to focus on it, changing a habit. And so I just revert back to my own coping strategies. I'm tired. I can't, you know, I've got a lot to do. Chocolate gives me a little caffeine, a little energy, a little perk in my dopamine. So I eat it. And so my point is, though, is that even when we want to change, even when we say we're going to change, Old habits die hard, uh, even for our own lives. And so I think we want to see what kind of habits he defines that he wants to change, not you define that you want him to change. See, pe people don't change bad habits if they don't want to. No one's going to tell me to give up chocolate. No one's going to tell me I have to eat healthy. I'm not going to do what they tell me to do. So you know, even your doctor, he might tell you to do this and you don't do it because you aren't ready. You don't want to, it's too hard. So I think the question becomes, what are his patterns? What are his habits? What, whatever they are, his habit is to lie. His habit is to, you know, watch porn every night. His habit, what are his plans to change those habits? And are you seeing him making effort, extending energy and being responsible for changing those habits? Or does he blame you for the habits? Does he make excuses for himself why he can't change the habits? Does he lie about not doing the work? Is he not willing to do the work? I mean, wanting to do something and actually doing it are two different things. So he may be blowing smoke and telling you he's going to change, or he may be sincere. But I think the question becomes, so yeah, you've been in this habit pattern of blowing your stack for years and years and years, what are you going to do differently? How are you going to have accountability to not do that? Who's going to teach you how to handle your anger differently? Because you've always handled your anger this way. Your dad's always handled his anger this way. Who's going to teach you how to calm down when you're starting to blow your stack? Who's going to teach you to recognize when you're getting angry at a five before you get to a 10? Um, those, those are questions and you don't want to be your husband's parent, right? And you don't want to be your husband's therapist. They don't like it and you don't like it. So even asking those questions is kind of dicey in a marriage. So I think what we're looking for is, is he saying, I need help. I don't know how I've got to, you know, get some counseling help or some coaching help or some men's accountability group, or I need to do this with some people around me who've already done this well, so I can learn from them. Is he just like if he wanted to learn to play a new sport, if he wanted to learn to golf or he wanted to learn to shoot or he wanted to learn to play, you know, pickleball, he probably would want to be with people who know how to do that and could teach him. And he would exert the effort. You wouldn't have to nag him to do it. You wouldn't have to remind him to do it. He would do it because he wanted to. So we're looking for that energy of, I want to change and I'm willing to put in the effort and I'm willing to do the work. And if you don't see any of that, you just hear smooth words, fancy talk, romantic gestures, love bombing. This is a distraction to make you feel better without actually having to do any work. So if I'm hearing you right, then you're saying that first he needs to kind of have this awareness and acknowledge that, yeah, there's a problem and I need to work on it. 
But then second, he needs to actually follow through so that when an argument is starting or he is starting to feel that escalation, that the woman would see he's acting different or he would at least take the feedback. Is that correct? That there's action and energy behind it? Yeah. So he has to accept, you said it right. He has to accept that he has a problem. And so many people that we listen to blame their problem on the wife. (laughs) You know, you push my buttons. Well, if only you had dinner ready on time, if only you kept the kids quiet, if only you picked up the house, if only you, you know, lost your weight, if whatever it is, it's always your problem that he can't control himself. And that's not true. He may not like some things that you do or you don't do, which is true in any marriage. But the fact that he uses it as an excuse to hurt you or harm you or harm the children or blow up or cheat on you or lie to you or whatever it is, that's the way he copes with something he doesn't like. And that's totally 100% on him. There's things about him that you don't like either, I'm sure. And you don't go and cheat and lie and steal or blow up or do you know wicked things just to tell him it's his fault that he you did that. Each of us are responsible for ourselves. So if he doesn't take that very first step and say, you know, I may not like that you don't make a good dinner, or I may not like that the kids aren't obedient as I want them to be, or I may not like that the traffic isn't moving the way I want it to, but I am responsible to control my temper. Um, or I may not like that I have to admit failure to you, but I am responsible for the lies I tell. Right. So, whatever it is that the pattern is that is causing the harm in the marriage, and it might be multiple things. Um, He has to own that he's got some issues and he has to, and not he has to, he doesn't have to, but he wants to, he wants to change. And I think this is the, this is the crux for so many women is they kind of put the, the, like you have to change and he doesn't have to, he can be exactly the way he wants to. You have to decide whether or not you want to live with that. You both get to choose, huh? Yeah. So you were talking about not wanting to be your husband's parent. So regarding feedback and correction and maybe even consequences, how do, how does a woman keep herself from becoming the change police every time he makes a mistake? And you know, what is the proper balance there? So she's not becoming that. Well, I think he needs to become the the police of himself. That's part of stewarding your own life. And so if I said to my husband, hey, I'm going to give up chocolate and I, you know, I really want to change the way I eat. And he sees me putting a chocolate in my mouth or he sees me getting a, a bowl of ice cream and he says, oh, I'm the police of you. You're not allowed to eat that. That would go over terrible. I would not, not well. like it. I would yeah. not receive it. And I would be like, who are you to tell me what to do? I might not say that quite that way out loud, but that's what my inner self would be saying. So I think it's really important that we give people the freedom. Love gives people the freedom. When you love someone, you give them the freedom to be who they want to be, even if you don't like that person. You, mm-hmm. Jesus gave people the freedom to be who they wanted to be, even if yeah. they didn't want to be in a relationship with him, even if they did things that were destructive. He gave them the freedom. God gave Adam and Eve the freedom to make their own decisions. And so I think it's really important that a woman who's in this kind of marriage does her own work to not need her husband to do something in order for her to be okay, whether need him to change in order for her to be safe, need him to repent in order for her to, you know, get over her resentment. Because if you need someone to do something in order for you to be okay, you live as a prisoner of them. And so God calls each of us to steward our lives and be responsible. So me, he may have totally destroyed your relationship, but don't let him destroy you. And so I think giving him the freedom and saying, if you can, with sincerity, I want the best for you. That's what love does. Love cares about the best for somebody. They want their best. And best isn't what feels good. It means their long-term best interest. I want the best for you. And if you feel the best for you is to continue to drink and take drugs and, you know, watch porn or, you know, lie in relationships, I, I can't change that, but I won't live with that. I will let you go because oil and water can't mix. And you want a kind of life that I don't want to live at all. That's not best for me. So I can't partner with you anymore. And I think those are the hard conversations that we're so afraid to have. But I think those are the conversations, not threats, not threats. Like, hey, if you don't start picking up your clothes, I'm going to file for divorce. I mean, we're not talking about minor things. We're talking about true deal breakers that break trust and 
safety in a relationship, in a long-term relationship. Um, those kind of things. Um, I think that if a woman can't trust her husband to want to make changes to create safety and trust in the relationship, then she may have to take measures to create safety and trust for her and the kids. And that may be leaving. Hey friend, Leslie's free live workshop is tomorrow and you still have time to sign up. You know those times in your life when you look back and say, that was when everything changed? This workshop can be one of those times in your life. A time when everything changes in a good way. A time when you finally say goodbye to beliefs that have no real biblical truth. Beliefs like, you need to die to yourself to keep your marriage intact. Wrong. Or how about this gem? Your husband's need for respect is more important than your need to be heard. Sorry, that's not true. And don't even get me started on God hates divorce. It's time to break up with these beliefs. Friend, they're not in the Bible. Do yourself a life-changing favor and register now for this free workshop. It's happening tomorrow, April 9th at noon and 7.30 Eastern. Leslie is going to dive deep into what the Bible actually says on these topics. And if you have questions, she's going to answer them live. You'll also get a free workbook with all of the references so you can do your own work on what the Bible has to say about these topics. Go right now to leslievernick.com forward slash free training to register. Listen, if you enjoy this podcast, then you're going to love this workshop. It's time for a fresh start, and it all starts with you. See you tomorrow. What kind of other measures, other than just throwing out the divorce card, would be an option? Say he's got a temper problem and he throws things or yells in front of the kids or whatever, uh, or a porn issue. Instead of saying, if I catch you watching porn one more time, I'm going to file for divorce. What are some other levels of consequences that a woman could set as boundaries for herself? Well, I think, you know, porn is an epidemic and many good men get caught in that temptation and then becomes a habit and then it becomes an addiction. Um, So I think that we have to have empathy and compassion. Galatians 6, one says those who are caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So I think being able to speak the truth in love with compassion and gentleness. But again, when someone's caught in a trespass, whatever it is, whether it's lying, addiction, adultery, um, abuse, any of those big, big deal breaker kinds of things, to be able to say, Ultimately, you have to decide the kind of person you want to be. And if you choose these choices to continue in this path, I can't in good conscience allow myself to walk with you in that path as your partner, because it's so hurtful, harmful to me and the kids to watch you hurt yourself, to watch you hurt us to experience the harm that you cause by your financial mismanagement, by your spending on addictions, by your temper problems, you know, putting the kids down when you're high, whatever it might be, I'd be very specific, that I can't continue to allow myself and the kids to be subjected to that over and over again. So I'm respecting your no, you don't want to change. And that leaves me no other options than to create some separate space. Now it may not be separate space, moving away, depending on the degree of your safety and all of that. So for a porn addiction, like you just said, it might be, you know, I can't control your conscience. I can't control what you put in your mind. That's your job to do. God calls you to control what you put in your mind and to renew your mind with God's truth. But all I can do is control what happens to me when you do that. And what happens to me when you do that, and I know that you're doing that, is I feel like I'm just one of your porn objects in our sexual relationship. And therefore, I'm not going to allow myself to go there. I'm not going to allow myself to be objectified and used as someone who just gives you pleasure. That's not intimacy in marriage is for both partners to commit in a 
tender-hearted, loving way to be vulnerable and honest with one another in the, in the most sensitive areas of all of life, our sex life. And you're not there with me. You're there with a million other women. And I am not going to be a partner of that. So if you choose to continue to do that, I'm choosing to withdraw myself from our sexual relationship uh, for a season until you can think through your options of how you want to be as a man. So that might be another boundary for safety. And you don't have to be scolding. You don't have to be, you know, shaming. You don't have to be demeaning. You know, you're just a pervert. You're just a porn addict. You know, you don't, I mean, how would you feel if your husband said you're just a glutton, you know, if you're having a problem with eating, you don't, you know, you don't want someone to shame you or all that, but you do have to speak the truth in love. And this is what are your options. And this is what my options are. And I am unwilling. And I think this is where a lot of women are going to be hung up on, well, I'm not allowed to leave because God hates divorce. And I have been married a long time to the same person. I believe in the sanctity of marriage. I think you can do all you can to have a good marriage. But if your marriage lacks, consistently lacks trust and safety, you don't have a marriage. You have a legal arrangement uh, to be used and abused. And I don't think- God gets no glory in that. Yeah. And I don't think the scriptures support that. No. So um, the verse in Malachi that's been mistranslated, God hates divorce, doesn't say that. It was mistranslated by the King James version of the Bible when it was translated into English. The original Bible texts never said that. And now it's being retranslated into what it really says. And it says something like this. I hate when a man treats his wife treacherously and throws her out like a used tissue. So it was really talking about men who were married a long time, who found new women, younger women, and tossed their wives out, didn't even give them a certificate of divorce, which in the Old Testament was their freedom to go remarry. They just abandoned them. And God's saying, hey, I care about women. That's that's not right. You don't treat women that way. And so in this patriarchal culture where it was normal to treat women and slaves like just objects, God is there to protect women. And so I think sometimes women have been mad at God, like, God, don't you care about me? You just care about my husband and his sex needs and, you know, keeping this marriage together and I'm dying inside. God does care about women. And again, I am not saying you should divorce for trivial, trivial reasons that you don't, you know, feel a soul connection. You don't like that he's sloppy. Those are not divorceable reasons. Those are reasons for growth and learning uh, to bear with one another and uh, accept one another, even if, you don't like everything. But when someone does something intentionally over and over again, this pattern of harming you and harming the relationship, the Bible tells us in Romans, love does no harm. And so when someone intentionally, willfully, maliciously continues to harm you, I don't think God says you're supposed to just suffer and sacrifice for the sake of enabling them to do it some more. I mean, that's craziness. That's only enabling their worst self to continue, not praying for their best self. And so again, speaking the truth in love and saying, you're allowed to be the self you want to be. But if you choose to be this self, this self is not compatible with me because I feel scared of you and I don't trust you. It's so true because you can take this one verse, this one mistranslated verse and literally live your life around it while completely ignoring the rest of scripture that shows the heart of God. And that mistranslated verse completely ignores the heart of God. The heart of God is for people. He loves people and it is not that he wants them to be abused. So I, I really hope people will hear that. That's so good. Uh, let's just say, Leslie, that the goal, you know, the husband is on board and he wants to heal the marriage. He wants to build a new history. He's trying his best, maybe not perfectly. How does a woman move forward in that? When she is so hurt by the past, how does she not hold it over his head? Well, I think that's where forgiveness comes in. So there's two stages of all of this. Um, so the first stage is, is he accepting responsibility for what he did? Is he repentant? Which means not just, I'm sorry, take me back, but repentance means I'm in the process of changing. Like I'm not going to continue to do this. This is repentance means turning around and going the other direction. So is there repentance there? Is he demonstrating some actual change 
both in his inner world, like I'm not thinking I'm entitled anymore. I'm not demanding you do things my way anymore, as well as his outer world in handling himself in new ways. Are you seeing those evidences, those fruits the Bible talks about of repentance? We can't see someone's heart, but we can see their actions. And the Bible says over and over again, trust the actions over the words that if they say they're a Christian and yet live like the devil, don't believe them. And so watch what they're doing, no matter what they say. Um, and if, you know, the Bible says in, in uh, first John, if, if you hate your brother, when you treat people treacherously, the love of God is not in you. Even if you say I'm a Christian. So behavior says everything. Proverbs says, even a child is known by their actions. So we want to see, has there been acceptance? Has there been repentance? Is there some change happening? And only, and then you decide. So that's his work to do. Your work to do as the recipient of his harm is, am I willing to forgive? Am I willing to let it go? Am I not forget and never think about it again, but am I willing to release him from the debt? and not keep holding it over his head. That is so hard sometimes because like speaking of debt, say he was financially irresponsible. He acknowledges it, but every month if she's paying the bills, she's having to pay on that loan that he took out without her permission or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, it's got to dredge up something or, you know, maybe she's still having to take medication for the, you know, sexually transmitted disease that he brought back to her. And just dealing with those feelings and not mentioning it to him all the time, I think would be so brutally hard. It would be. And so those are the things that are, so so that's why these serious sins can permanently damage and break apart a marriage because it's like, I don't know that I can ever trust him again, but here's the deal, Julie, if you don't forgive and you don't let go of the resentment, the person who's harmed the most by all that is you right? Because yeah. you're the one who's going to suffer that anger that moves into resentment and then begins to rot your bones, the Bible says. And so I hope you don't want to do that. Even if your marriage fails and you come to a place where, hey, I can't trust you. I don't want to be reconciled with you because you don't show me enough fruit of repentance, or maybe they do show you some fruit of repentance, but you don't think you ever could trust them again. If someone uh, uh, molests your child, I think that's a pretty poignant example. Or someone steals from your house, you might forgive your friend. You might see that they're really sorry, but probably you're not going to hire them to clean your house again. Or probably you're not going to let them babysit your kid again because trust has been permanently broken. And so if that's the case, I think it's more authentically honest to cry uncle and say, I don't know that I'll ever be able to trust you again. And, and I'll that's have to okay. work out my, yeah. yeah. And I'll have, that's sometimes the consequence of sin. The the picture that I use about this is if you, you know, if you were driving and carelessly texting, I have a friend who was driving her car and putting lipstick on, uh, you know how women do that in the mirror and she hit a woman on a bicycle and killed her. Oh my gosh. And you can be truly repentant, but let's say you did it, you know, you were texting or you were you know, drunk or something. And you say, I'm going to change. I'm never going to, she never puts lipstick on the mirror anymore. You know, she really changed, but the woman stayed dead. Like sometimes we think as Christians, like the consequences, if you're sorry, shouldn't be there, but sometimes the consequences are still there. The, the marriage is still dead. And I think it's more honest if a woman is struggling with true forgiveness and doesn't feel she can ever reconcile with this person again because she doesn't feel safe. Um, it's okay to to say that and not feel like oh, I'm a bad Christian because I'm not trusting God. You can trust God and still say, I don't think I want to live with this person. The harm has been too great. And I don't want to ever take a chance that he might have a slip up and do it again. Um, just like you wouldn't with a child who'd been molested. Sometimes consequences of sin is permanent. And sometimes the broken marriage is a permanent consequence or the broken relationship is a permanent consequence of someone's sin. So I think we've been really short-sighted and really recognizing that in the church, we've given women a guilt trip, like somehow he's sorry. So you have to be willing to have sex with him again, even though he raped you three quarters of your marriage. You know, you can't, you just, your body won't do it. So we we want to take the guilt trip off of women that you don't have to do that reconciliation pace if if you can't let go of some of this. But the work that you have to do in order for the reconciliation piece to happen, or even just for you to move on, is that you do have to let go of the resentment. 
And you do have to forgive. God says to do it. And so if you want to be a woman of God, if you want to follow God, he's not doing it just because he's trying to, you know, be mean to you. He's saying this is best for you, even if it even if it never fixes the relationship. Yeah. You do know, you want to keep drinking that poison of resentment the rest of your life because what he did to you? And I hope not. And so so this is where a couple sometimes who the victim, the woman doesn't feel she has her own work to do, but she does have her own work to do. She has her own work to do of learning to speak up for herself. She has her own work to do of evaluating whether she can, uh, you know, trust again and whether trust is truly being rebuilt. She has to do her own work as to whether she um, doesn't want to live with him anymore. And if she doesn't, what does that bring up for her? Because it might be like, oh my gosh, I've got to go to work. I've got to support the kids. And what does that look like? And so sometimes we default to just putting up with things because we aren't willing to do our own work. We're not willing to do our work of saying, I need to go back to college. I need to get a job. I need to do those things so that I am free to be separate and not Mm -hmm. have to depend on him. So we keep depending on him and he keeps having power over us because we're not capable or able to say, I'm not willing to live like this because we haven't done our own work to be able to be capable of doing that if we need to. Your story about your friend, actually reminded me years and years ago, I was in Southern California, San Bernardino Mountains, um, driving at night. And there was a woman that I came across an accident. Turned out she had been drinking and there had been a group of kids coming down the mountain on their bicycles and she hit one of them. You know, of course I, I pulled over and checked him and thought he was breathing, but anyway, he passed away. He died. And so I was there with all of his friends, you know, trying to comfort them. And we went with the coroner to the family's home while the coroner notified the family because I wanted the family to see me, to know that I was with their son, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and I remember hearing that woman scream when she found out. And then later they invited me in the house and the older brother came home. And he was like, what's going on? What's going on? And the the woman, the mother explained it to him while well, he saw me sitting on the couch and thought I was the one that killed his brother. So he literally started coming at me and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to die tonight too. And his mother's hanging on his arm and he he realized it wasn't me. So he turns around and he's banging on the front windshield, the, the glass window. And he he was so angry, which anybody would be. But as you're talking about all of this, I I see that, I picture that and think they were such victims of this woman who decided to drink and drive, but that anger that he had, that absolute rage, that raw rage, he is going to have to deal with and because he's left with it and it's not his fault. But I think so are these women that we are talking to today. Some of them are so filled with rage because of not only what they did to her, but to their kids, to the family, to to the dream that was supposed to be. Right. And it's okay. You have every right to be mad. But and the anger is, is totally right. legitimate. It is totally legitimate. Yeah. But if you if this young man hangs on to the anger for the rest of his life, it will it will deform him. Yes. Absolutely. What happens to you is horrible. What happened to this family is horrible. Um, sin is icky and and reckless behavior causes a lot of damage. But, and God doesn't want you to live bitter and angry and resentful over what happened to you. You, you can write another chapter to this story. It doesn't end with, and the family lived miserably after, ever after, <laughs> right? I mean, what a horrible right. ending to end right. that Right. And so, and so we love to see even, you know, in, in crises in the world or whatever, we love to see the, the, the stories that come out of the ashes of love and care and companionship and fortitude and resilience. And, and so we get a chance to, or have an opportunity to, to write the next chapter and whether it's reconciliation of the marriage, which I would love to see, or if it's just, you got out alive and you grew into a new person, that's still a good story, even if your marriage didn't make it. But you don't want to end the story with, and this ruined the rest of her life. Leslie, that is so good. Whether he changes or not, you can still have a happy ending. It may not be the ending that you wanted, 
but it can still be a good one. Mm -hmm. Would you pray for our listeners, and especially those who are hoping that his husband will get it and change, but regardless that they would know whether or not his change is real? Lord, we just pray for great wisdom and a spirit of calmness on these women who have been so deeply hurt by the recklessness of their spouse, just like the recklessness of this woman so deeply impacted this other family, that you would help them in their anger, which is righteous, which is true and good, actually, because it gives them the energy to say, enough already, I'm not doing this. That then you would give them the courage to speak the truth in love, to have appropriate boundaries, to have consequences, and including perhaps separating from the marriage as a consequence of this reckless, damaging behavior, that they don't keep putting themselves in harm's way. That if you know a drunk driver is coming down the road, you don't let your kid out on a bicycle. And Lord, so often because we have valued the sanctity of marriage, we have put ourselves in harm's way thinking that that was an honorable sacrifice. But Lord, it is not, we have learned it is not good or true or right to sacrifice the best of who we are and our children in order to enable the worst in someone else to continue. So Father, I pray that a woman who's listening to this, who's in this situation, will begin to see that she has her own work to do of getting stronger, of getting healthier, of not being so dependent on him to change in order for her to be okay. Of learning that she needs to steward her safety and her children's safety and her sanity. And if she is not only getting angry, but now becoming bitter and resentful or depressed or suicidal or all the things that I hear from women whose marriages are terrible, dangerous, destructive, abusive. Father, that you would give her another option, another choice that she can do and work with, surround her with supportive women who can help her, godly women who can lead her to safety and her children to health and restoration and not continued abuse and oppression. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this 100th episode of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. If you've been listening and nodding your head thinking, I want more of this, then go right now to leslievernick.com forward slash free training and sign up for Leslie's workshop. It happens tomorrow, April 9th at noon and 7.30 Eastern. Until next time, may God bless all of your relationships with him with yourself and with others.